Good evening and welcome tonight to Acadia Divinity College and our online Simpson Lectures. My name is Stuart Blythe. I'm a member of faculty here. I'm the Associate Professor in the John Gladstone Chair of Preaching and Worship. I'm also the Director of the Simpson Lectures and that means I get to, to introduce our speaker tonight, which I will do in a moment. Sometimes we have other people who come in on different nights to do some of the introductions but because we're delivering it this way online, it's more convenient for us to do it. I'm afraid, therefore, you are stuck with me. A couple of uh, technical issues that you might find helpful. If you want to ask questions, the best way to do that is to watch the live stream on our website. There you can put questions in a chat box. You can indeed participate in the chat. There's also a button for you to ask questions. And it's from there that I will primarily pick up collect, collate and communicate any questions that are asked. Tomorrow, among our, among our activities, we will be having a Wednesday chapel service. This service won't be live streamed and therefore if you've registered, you should have a Zoom link for that. Rennie McVicker will be speaking that and we invite you to join us for that, to join us again in the afternoon for a Red Sofa conversation with Dr Robbins and Dr No and join us tomorrow evening for the final of the three evening lectures. Recordings of the sessions will be available on our Facebook and YouTube channels immediately following the lecture. Higher quality recordings will be on the website in the coming weeks. I should also note under these technical issues that we give our thanks to our Director of Technology who is in the building with me and is helping to manage a huge variety of things. For me, it's good to see John having to move at such speed around the table in order to make sure everything that's coming together. But we're very grateful for all that he's done in order to make these lectures happen. happen. So thank you for that, John. We appreciate it. I want to now introduce Dr. No. Last night, I gave a, a, a larger introduction than I will do tonight. But tonight, I will put in a piece of information that those who weren't with us last night perhaps did not get. Dr. No is the Associate Professor of Counselling Psychology at Tyndale University. Her areas of research interests, and this really reflects in the lectures, are applied psychology and counselling, but with an emphasis on the integration of psychology theology and spirituality. And if you heard the lecture last night, you would have seen some of that integration taking place. Dr. No has qualifications from University of Toronto, as well as her MS, MA and PhD from Fuller Theological Seminary. In the correspondence that has taken place with Dr. No, I communicated with her because, and you will see tonight, I am branded so that Dr. Robbins will be pleased to see that I am wearing the colours of Acadia Divinity College. And we like to give our guests at the Simpson Lectures some memorabilia, merchandise that reflects Acadia Divinity College. And because Dr. No wasn't going to actually be here in person, I sent her an email, I asked for her address, and I said in it, can you give me your address because we would like to send you some swag. She replied very nicely, I look forward to receiving some ADC swag, although in all honesty, I'm not quite sure what that means. At this point, I panicked, for I realised I didn't know what it meant either. I know that swag is something that is usually stolen, so I didn't want to communicate that we'd stolen things. Therefore, I, I followed an age-old tradition at this point, I looked for someone else to blame because that word must have entered my head from somewhere. I'm not going to throw a colleague under the bus by naming names, but she said to me that swag stands for stuff we all get. However, Dr. Noah, I need you to know that what you got was not what we all get. This led to a dilemma. However, it was resolved this evening. As I was sitting eating my supper, I told my wife, Suzanne, about the problem I had, and she said, well, it means stuff we are given. So, indeed, that is the swag, the stuff that you are given. And I believe some of that swag may appear tomorrow in the, the Red Sofa conversation. So I'm glad 
as we are learning from you, you at least get one small thing from us about what we mean in ADC when we talk about swag. Last night, Dr. No introduced us under the heading of fearfully and wonderfully made to an integrative paradigm of personhood, one that brings together theological and psychological understanding. And we know that some of you are anxious to get at the how do I understand and what do I do? But last night's lecture forms the basis from which he intends in the following lectures to unpack some more of the practical outcomes and practices. Therefore, Dr. No, we welcome you here. We thank you for your lecture last night. And before I hand over to you, I would like to lead us in prayer. Let us pray together. And in the prayer, I'm going to pray for the church, making use of a Celtic prayer. And at the end of that, we'll include a prayer for you, Dr. No. Let us pray. Almighty God, we pray for the family of the church. We pray for your church throughout the world, that it may be filled with the wine of new life and the fire of the Holy Spirit. Kindle in the hearts of all your people such love towards you that it wells up and spills over into the life of the world. May openness and love take the place of hypocrisy and hate. May generosity and gentleness take the place of greed and aggression. And may the whole world come to know of your love and compassion through the work of a loving and compassionate church. We pray tonight that we will be open to learn from Dr. No more about what it means for us to be such a church as we seek to minister to people who in various ways face challenges around issues of mental health. Be with her, we pray, as we ask you to be with us, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Dr. Noah, I hand over to you. Thank you so much. And um, just as a follow-up, I was... I, I've decided that I'm going to try to incorporate the word swag at Tyndale and um, we'll see if, if, if they catch on and I'll make sure to let them know that it's not stolen goods, but something we receive is something we get. So thank you. Well, good evening and welcome to day two of the Simpson Lecture. And it was great with you last evening for your very thoughtful and relevant questions. Lecturing through this medium of live streaming actually requires a lot of faith, faith that there are real people on the other side and that they are engaging with the material. And to be honest and transparent, yesterday was actually the first time I lectured live as opposed to Zoom, where I can still see the faces of my students and I have them respond to questions that I pose throughout the lecture. So it took me a few moments to adjust, but by God's grace, especially because this is really not about me, but about God's heart to minister to each one of you who are listening. I was encouraged by your questions because it affirmed how much you desire to learn, to grow, to heal, and to be better equipped to journey with those who may be struggling with mental health challenges. As Dr. Blige in his introduction today, I recognize that many of us want to know the how-tos, and we will get there in tonight's lecture and tomorrow, but I wanted to begin this series by presenting a more holistic integrative paradigm of personhood that emphasizes the different layers of who we are and how our personhood has developed through the three canvases of the original, broken, and redeemed design. For it is my belief that when we're able to see a more holistic paradigm of personhood, we can then place mental illness in its proper place as well. Mental illness at its most fundamental level, as we talked about yesterday, is evidence of our broken design as a result of the fall. And that brokenness can affect all the layers of who we are. And yet the good news is that through Christ, there is redemption, there is restoration, which is a spiritual layer, but in all the layers of our personhood as well. However, we must remember that although in Christ we are saved, we are also being saved, being renewed, being sanctified each day. And this is our lifelong journey of spiritual formation. Therefore, although some of us may continue to struggle with mental health challenges and illnesses through the redeeming and sanctifying work of Christ on the cross, may we remember that they never have the power to define us, to limit us, or to hinder us 
from living out God's purpose and will for our lives. So I wanna really proclaim that truth that I spoke yesterday, for we have been fearfully and wonderfully made by him. I hope and pray that this truth may minister deeply and powerfully to those who may have felt stuck, maybe stuck in shame, condemnation about God's presence and love for you in the midst of your struggles. May you find courage to come back into God's presence and promise so that you may experience the fullness of his love, grace, mercy, peace, and hope. The focus of tonight's lecture will be on living in the messy middle and with the emphasis on how to journey with those in your life who may be struggling with mental health challenges. I'll be beginning by briefly extrapolating on what this messy middle means, drawing upon the theology of eschatology. We'll then take a deeper look at some of the commonly encountered mental illnesses, both within the church and larger culture. And the final section of the lecture will focus on the different domains of recovery, provide some very tangible suggestions for both individuals struggling with mental illness and for the loved ones journeying with them. So that is going to be a brief overview of our lecture for today. So let's begin then with the opening question of what is the messy middle? Drawing from an article written by Dr. Deguid in 2006, he writes this, the stories of the Bible in the Old Testament are full of people whose lives are lived between the accomplishing of their redemption and its consummation, between the Exodus and the Promised Land. They live in between the and their present in the fullness of their salvation, but rather of the wilderness along the way. Although Dr. Deguid is referring to the people in the Bible, this sounds all too familiar to our lives in the present as well. Dr. David Briones, who is a professor at Westminster Theological Seminary, similarly writes, referring to believers today, Christians live in a great theological tension. We already possess every spiritual blessing in Christ, but we do not experience the fullness of these blessings yet. In one sense, we are already adopted, redeemed, sanctified, and saved. In another, these experiences are yet fully ours. Therefore, this theological tension, this life lived in the in-between times, is what theologians refer to as the theology of eschatology. Although there is so much more to this theology than what I'm going to be talking about today, the focus for tonight is on the idea of the now and not yet, which basically states that we already have the now which is Jesus's first coming, his redemptive work, resurrection, and giving of the spirit. But we're also waiting for the not yet, which is the second coming of Christ, the establishment of his kingdom, the day where every tear is wiped away. And in the way not yet, we are living in between the times. And so what then does life look like in the in-between times? Well, because of the theology of eschatology, we can find hope because we know that our future is certain, that there will be final victory and we will experience complete healing in Christ. But because we still live on this side of heaven, as I noted in yesterday's lecture, there will still be suffering, pain, sin, brokenness in ourselves, in our relationships, in our churches, and in this world. In other words, life in the in-between times can be described simply as the messy. And one of the evidences of this messiness is actually the realities of mental illness and the suffering that it can bring to individuals and loved ones. So for today, I'd like to now take a little bit of a deeper look into some of the more commonly encountered mental illnesses, including some of the ones that I mentioned in lecture one, but one important word of caution that I wanna to send to each of you is that first of all, please do not utilize this material to self-diagnose. You know, we hear about this as medical students, as they start learning about all the medical conditions, they start self-diagnosing and they think they have every disease. We call that the medical scenario. I want to really caution and ask that you don't use this material to self-diagnose or worse yet, to start diagnosing all the people in your life. I kind of always joke to my students, 
when we learn these, don't go around and start diagnosing everyone. You're not going to be invited to many gatherings or parties. But if you do suspect that this applies to a loved one or a congregation member, I will be giving some advice at the end of how to bring up the subject in a gentle, loving way. But if you do suspect that this applies to yourself, I want to gently encourage you to be willing to seek professional advice. So let's begin then in terms of gaining a little bit more of a deeper understanding of mental illness. In the field of psychology and psychiatry, illness is defined as a clinically significant disruption in a person's thoughts, moods, behaviors, or ability to relate with others, resulting in serious functional impairment, which substantially interferes with or limits one or more major life activities. I know that while many people will have significant changes in these various areas during a normal lifetime, even as evidenced in our COVID pandemic, those changes are not usually severe enough to require treatment or intervention. A mental illness, on the other hand, is a debilitating experience in which a person is simply unable to function normally over an extended period of time. So that causes, well, again, this is so much more complex than what I can go through for tonight, but I do want to emphasize that mental disorders result from a complex interaction of both biological and environmental factors. All people are born with differing degrees of biological vulnerabilities or predispositions for developing mental health difficulties and disorders. But having a predisposition alone is not enough to trigger the illness. Instead, an individual's biological vulnerability must interact with stressful life events in order to prompt the onset of the illness. And the greater the underlying biological vulnerability an individual is born with, the less stress that is needed to trigger the onset of the illness. Conversely, in individuals born with biological predispositions, greater life stress is required to produce the disorder. And until this critical level of stress has been reached or the critical level of life stress has been reached, people will generally be able to function normally and sometimes even the biological vulnerabilities are hidden. COVID-19 may be an example of a stressor. For some, this has been enough of a stressor to trigger some of the symptoms of depression or anxiety. While for others, it may have been very difficult, but not enough to produce any dysfunctional behavior and moods. And so then what then are some of the more commonly encountered mental illnesses? And kind of in line with one of the questions that was asked yesterday, how can we gain a deep so we can differentiate uh, what is within the range of clinical normality, and then how do we know when it falls outside the range to a disorder. So I'm going to go through four commonly encountered mental illnesses, a couple of them that I noted yesterday. So let's begin with the first one, which is depressive disorders. I know over the last year, with our lives having been turned upside down as a result of the coronavirus, mental health issues have spiked. Um, I'm going to go through some of the statistics tomorrow as we talk about sort of mental illness and the church's response. But sort of at a very basic level, more than half of adults that have been sampled have said that their mental health have be has become worse during the learning. It's not surprising. Isolation, fear, stress surrounding the uncertainty is always going to take a toll. But at what point do we differentiate between feeling low and having a mental health issue that needs to be addressed? Sadness is a normal emotion that everyone will experience at some point in their life, be it as a result of a loss of a job, the end of a relationship, the death of a loved one. And sadness is usually caused by specific situations, person, or event. As well, when it is within the range of normal sadness, it can still give us sort of a bleak overlook, you know, overall overlook in many areas of life. However, this is still very different than depression. Depression is the characteristic feature of depression is a persistently depressed and empty mood that arises spontaneously and is long lasting causing impairment in the individual's ability to function. In other words, depression is marked by 
depressed mood for most of the day, almost every day, and a markedly diminished interest or pleasure in things that a person once found pleasurable. So a person suffering from depression feels sad or hopeless about everything almost every day without any specific situation or trigger. In many cases, the person may have actually every reason in the world to be happy, and yet they lose the ability to experience that joy or even in a family role. Other sort of emotions that may be accompanying depression are things like being easily agitated or irritated, or a feeling of numbness, or this feeling of not being able to relate to others, or always feeling misunderstood, consistently feeling low or feeling isolated, feeling numb or empty, or even crying often. And this may result in detachment from others and even finding it difficult to talk with others. These are some of the main symptoms around sort of depressed moods and diminished pleasures in activities. There are also some important symptoms as well, most notably changing and eating. We experience normal sadness triggered by a certain event or situation. Most are able to sleep normally and most remain motivated to do things and even maintain a desire to eat. Depression, on the other hand, is associated with serious disruptions of normal eating oftentimes resulting in sudden weight gain or loss, and sleeping patterns such as not wanting to get out of bed all day. Another important characteristic is negative thought patterns. Again, in normal sadness, it's very common to feel a sense of regret or remorse for something you may have said or done, but what doesn't, we don't feel any permanent sort of sense of worthlessness or guilt. Whereas in depression, there is this kind of self-diminishing negative thought pattern, especially around excessive guilt or feelings of worthlessness. And it's important to know that this can manifest itself even in spirituality. I can remember um, many, many, many years ago when I was mentoring a young, uh, a young girl who was in, in, in college, um, I remember that she was constantly struggling with these excessive fears and guilt that she had blasphemed the Holy Spirit and therefore would not be forgiven as found in Mark chapter three, verse 28 to 30. It didn't matter how much we talked about what this passage meant or about God's grace and love. She had so perseverated on this guilt that she had somehow blasphemed the Holy Spirit, even though that was not an accurate reflection in her life or in her behaviors. And she was so steeped with fear that she would not, not be she was diagnosed with clinical depression. Another example is a client of mine who, way back in California, was diagnosed with depression and yet had such deep distorted beliefs that no one liked him, that he was worthless as a human being, and that even God could not truly love him. And yet in reality, he had many good friends who continued to affirm how much they cared for him. But deep inside, he kept having these feelings and beliefs that he was worthless. So once again, these sort of excessive feelings of guilt or, or worthlessness can also manifest themselves even spiritually. Another very important characteristic is self-harm inclinations. Most people in non-depressive sadness does, do not sort of uh, struggle with these kinds of self-harm behaviors or suicidal thoughts. Yet for those struggling with severe depression, they will often have thoughts of self-harm, death, or suicide, and maybe even have a suicide plan. It's also important to note that some of the symptoms can also manifest themselves in physical ways. For example, a loss of sex drive or interest in sex, lack of energy, increased feelings of aches and pains, even menstrual cycle changes in women. And there's also a less severe form of depression, which is called dysthymia or persistent depressive disorder, which are sort of characterized these symptoms in sort of less extreme ways and yet in longer periods of time. So this is one of the first commonly encountered sort of mental illnesses that we will see not only within mainstream culture, but even within the church. The second is what we refer to as bipolar disorder. Okay. Bipolar disorder is when there is sort of this 
is characterized by this cycling of mood changes where the individual experiences periods of great excitement, overactivity, even delusions and euphoria, which is known as mania, that is then followed by periods of depression, as I noted just before, with period in between. These fluctuations are not caused by situation or a person or event, but tend to happen for no apparent reason. And the duration and intensity of the highs and lows are also very important factors to consider. Some important sort of distinctives of the manic episodes include some of these symptoms. Things like higher than usual self-esteem, which has also been called like the sense of grandiosity or this feeling of invincibility or feel like they could conquer the world or do anything that they put their mind to. Also significantly reduced need for sleep. Increased in, in talkativeness, racing thoughts, distractibility, also an increase in goal directed behaviors, maybe even in your work or at school or even sexually, or in psychomotor agitation, sort of like these purposeless movements such as pacing back and forth. As well, many times in the manic episodes, the individual may engage in excessive involvement in pleasurable activities that are often risky or self destructive. For example, excessive spending or sexual promiscuity. And what we see here is, is that in bipolar kind of disorders, there are of course less intense um, episodes of mania called hypomanic episodes. But what we see that is the characteristic of bipolar is this cycling of these manic states and then falling into these depressive episodes. And so a very common pattern that we see in somebody with bipolar disorders and, and, and ones that I've seen even in a very close Christian frame, is that in his panic state, he can become so passionate and zealous and initiates many, many huge projects. He's charismatic in mobilizing people. And yet when the depressive cycle hits, he drops everything. He cannot complete any of the projects that were started. He shuts down, starts to feel so unworthy as a pastor, and even in many times has quit ministry. And then this cycle repeats. So this would be an example of bipolar disorder. The third one that I just want to give a very brief overview of is what is referred to as anxiety disorders. Right? Everyone knows what it's like to feel anxious, that uncomfortable, apprehensive feeling that comes over us when we're stressed. And at normal levels, us to act, it causes us to sort of, you know, keep focused. It causes us to be able to prepare for that action that, you know, whether we're in a dangerous situation, it keeps us on task when we're given an important presentation at work. And anxiety is a normal sort of cognitive physiological response that God has designed to call our attention to something that is serious and that motivates us to, to action. But with an anxiety disorder, the anxiety is not mild or brief but it is severe and chronic. And the most common is referred to as generalized anxiety disorder. It is characterized by excessive anxiety and worry, even though there is little or nothing to provoke it. And it usually needs to occur for at least six months. An individual with an anxiety disorder, the anxiety is severe enough for the individual's ability to function daily, for example, to study, work, socialize, even manage their daily tasks. And the anxiety is always more intense than the situation warrants. And the person will often recognize that as, so, as such, but they don't know how to deal with it, right? So it's oftentimes out of proportion to the actual danger or the situation. And in most cases, the anxiety is, is, is not even tied to a specific source of fear, worry, or stress. Some of the cognitive and behavioral symptoms of anxiety include things like anxious thoughts, like I'm losing control, or anxious predictions, like I'm gonna fumble with words and I'm gonna humiliate myself, or maybe even anxious beliefs, like only the weak get anxious. Manifest inappropriate behaviors, avoiding the feared situations, avoiding activities that elicit sort of those sensations similar to experiencing anxiety. It can also result in safety behaviors, which are a lot of those habits to sort of minimize those feelings of anxiety. And this person can also experience their anxiety through things like obsessive thinking or compulsive actions or even constant flashbacks to traumatic events. And during the disorder, the focus of the worry may shift from one concern to another. 
It's also important to note that many times anxiety can also be experienced with physical symptoms such as things like fatigue or sleeplessness, headaches or mus muscle tension, sweating, shortness of breath, irritability, and in some cases it can also be accompanied by an attack. Panic attacks are those consuming waves of fear and dread that are very common characteristics of anxiety disorders. It's this sudden surge of overwhelming fear and anxiety that reaches a peak within minutes. Many people who experience a panic attack, especially their first one, often confuse it as themselves having a heart attack or even dying. And what happens is, is, is that uh, these panic attacks can oftentimes then lead into this cycle where the anxiety becomes greater and greater and can even become generalized. Um, a person that I knew, um, you know, she always kind of struggled a little bit with anxiety, but one day as she was um, driving, she had a panic attack. And after that panic attack started to develop an anxiety disorder where she started to avoid driving. Eventually she avoided leaving home. She couldn't manage everyday tasks because she was so steeped in her anxiety. She, she sort of experienced all of those physical symptoms. For many months, she couldn't even come out to church. And so this anxiety became so debilitating that it then impeded just even her everyday normal function. The fourth one that I'd like for us to just very briefly, just because we know that there are many people who have experienced things like trauma, that there are uh, a group of disorders um, that are serious psychological reactions that may develop in some individuals following exposure to a traumatic or stressful event, such as childhood neglect, physical or sexual abuse, combat, physical assault, sexual assault, natural disasters, an accident, or even torture. The characteristic symptoms of those who may have trauma or stressor-related disorders can be divided into four broad categories. The first are what we refer to as intrusion symptoms, and these include these recurrent involuntary distressing memories, thoughts, or dreams of the traumatic event. It can also be experienced as things like flashbacks or even dissociative experiences in which one feels or acts as if the traumatic event is occurring right now. The second sort of characteristics or, or symptoms are the avoidance and efforts to avoid internal reminders of the traumatic events, for example, the memories or thoughts or feelings or even people, places or situations that remind them of the traumatic event. There's oftentimes preoccupation with avoiding trauma-related feelings and stimuli that actually can become the central focus of a person's life. The third sort of category of symptoms are, involves negative alterations in cognition and mood. This includes things such as memory important aspects of the traumatic event, maybe even um, feelings of depression, fear, guilt, shame, and feelings of isolation from others. And then the fourth sort of category of, of symptoms are what we refer to as hyperarousal symptoms. And these are often reported as some of the more troubling symptoms of these disorders. And these are symptoms such as feeling jumpy or easily startled at any small sort of sound or, or even movement. It can also be expressed in irritability or angry outbursts or self-destructive behaviors or even problems in concentrating or difficulty in sleeping. So these then are some of the, the key symptoms or characteristics that, that are related to these lesser related disorders. This then is sort of a very quick overview of some of the more commonly encountered sort of mental illnesses that we see, not only in the larger culture, but also within the church. And where I want to sort of land in this section is just to summarize and to repeat again, even ad nauseum, because it is so important. For those who may relate to one or, or more of these common mental illnesses or disorders, I want to remind you, please, that to remember that this is not a sin or a shame to struggle with mental illness. It's actually a very real part of our broken world, as we discussed yesterday. It does not define you either, and it is not a result of faith. But on the other hand, 
it is important to seek help if you are finding that it is causing significant impairments in your functioning and in your relationships. And I want to really encourage you to remember that God is walking with you and will give you the courage and strength to journey through this. And so if, for any of you, if, if this sort of resonated with you, I'd like to just really encourage you to maybe then use this as just sort of an opening to take courage to take the next step. The final section of today's lecture then will be focusing on what can we do to help for both those who may be struggling with mental illness and for those who are walking with a loved one suffering from mental illness. For we know that mental illness deeply and significantly impacts not only the individual, but the many family members and friends who desire to walk alongside them. And so this final section is what I then will refer to as journeying together. How then can we journey together in the messy middle of mental illness? In this final section, I'm going to be drawing from and adapting some of the work that has been written by Dr. Stanford in his book, The Grace, in his book called Grace for the Afflicted. It's a wonderful resource, but I'll also be including some suggestions from my own experience, especially in working and journeying with either individuals and family members and friends um, in this sort of of recovery. Okay, so I'll be drawing a little bit from Dr. Stanford, but also a lot from sort of my own experience as well. Well, to begin with, and really beginning to understand this sort of journeying together, it's important to recognize that mental disorders are chronic conditions, meaning that while we're presently able to treat or manage the symptoms, we're not always able to cure them. This is not to say that they cannot be cured as I have seen individuals be fully cured, things like their depression, anxiety, even some of their trauma-related disorders. And yet what is important to also recognize that not all will be cured. Because sometimes for reasons we do not fully understand, this too is the reality of life on this side of heaven as we shared in lecture one. However, the good news is this, that a majority of individuals with mental illness who receive treatment and have a strong support network of family and friends around them are able to experience recovery. Recovery is defined as a process of change through which an individual improves their health and wellness, live a self-directed life and strive to reach their full potential. The goal of recovery goes far beyond symptom reduction, but aims at equipping the individual and their loved live their life. The important thing to remember about recovery is that it is a process. It takes time. Sometimes it can feel like two steps forward, one step back, two step forward, three steps back, right? It can feel very messy. And it can differ from person to person. But the good news is, is that there is hope because people with mental illness can and do recover. And so in understanding recovery, I'd like to present a more holistic framework of this process in some ways, which in some ways actually parallels the integrative paradigm of personhood, all right? And, and in this sort of a holistic approach to mental illness, or just mental health recovery, be able to not only give some tangible sort of suggestions for those who are struggling with mental illness, but also for those who are walking alongside them. Right. So let's just take a very quick look at this holistic perspective. A holistic approach to mental health recovery relies, relieves physical and psychological suffering while revealing the unconditional love and limitless grace available only through a personal relationship with Jesus. Once again, recovery is a process. It is not a quick fix. And we will look at four areas or domains of recovery for the individual suffering, as well as how loved ones can walk and encourage and support the different areas, right? And those four domains that we're gonna look at are the physical domain, 
the mental domain, the relational domain, and the spiritual domain. Well, first of all, in the physical domain. You know, it's very easy for many of us to sort of separate the physical needs from our spiritual or to compartmentalize. And yet research will show over and over and over again of how physical needs associated with mental disorder are, are need to be so intricately connected and integrated into this process of recovery. And needs simply as taking medication, but also include some of the basics such as sleep, nutrition, and exercise. And like once again, so often we compartmentalize our physical or minimize the importance of our physical needs in favor of other domains. And yet I will see over and over and over again that when clients are able to, to move towards health, even at the physical level, this helps to lessen the severity of some of the symptoms. I know that it doesn't just apply to people who are struggling with mental illness. I know even for myself, when I am sleep deprived, I know I am not the best version of myself. And so when we apply this, we also see that you know, when we are able to keep the body and the brain healthy, this also can help lessen some of the severities of the symptoms. And so what are some of the key physical needs that are important in this process of recovery? Well, the first is sleeping well. Chronic sleep problems actually affect 50 to 80% of individuals living with mental health difficulties compared to about 10 to 18% of the general population. And of course, while excessive sleep can be a problem, the two most common complaints are not being able to fall asleep, which is onset insomnia, or waking up early and not being able to go back to sleep, which is called late insomnia. And it's been shown that sleep deprivation has been shown to trigger symptoms such as suicidal thoughts, paranoia, agitation, and hyperactivity, especially in those already on. And yet activities that can help one sleep better include things like just very simple things like having a set bedtime routine, regular exercise, avoiding the use of caffeine and nicotine or even alcohol before going to sleep and turning off our devices earlier. You know, when I was working with a client who was struggling with clinical depression, I implemented some of this with my client and really kept him accountable in some of his even basic sleep routines. And we saw some of his symptoms even becoming less as a result of getting better sleep in his every day. Also important to learn how to relax by becoming aware of how does my body react to stress and making sort of conscious efforts to practice relaxation techniques the moment you start to feel stress so you can catch it before it actually spirals out of control. This is the disorder as mindfulness training. It's about learning to listen to your body, learning to identify when you're starting to feel stress, and then implementing preventative sort of measures before the stress becomes overwhelming. Another important element around physical needs is even eating healthier. Too many of us also don't realize how poor diet can also disrupt so many other parts of our functioning, including things like our mood, our energy levels, our sleep. On the other hand, a balanced and nutritious diet promotes brain health and helps to stabilize mood. Another important physical need is being more active and incorporating pleasurable activities back into life. Of course, this doesn't mean that we need to now start an intense work, sort of regimen. At least get doing something that gets our bodies moving and is easy to maintain. Things like even just going for a walk each day. Doing something that brings pleasure. Because what we know is, is that when we are engaged in pleasurable activity, what we're doing is releasing natural levels of dopamine. And dopamine is that brain chemical that helps us to experience pleasure and even happiness. And so these then are some of the, the very basic sort of physical needs and things that we can do for especially those who are struggling with mental illness to start to reincorporate back into our lives. And so then what are some of the suggestions for family and friends of how we can walk alongside others? It's not rocket science. Sometimes it's about just simple things like maybe keeping your loved one accountable. They just setting up a schedule to exercise together once a week, 
or maybe cooking together healthier meals once a week. Maybe even encouraging active and pleasurable activities such as taking a walk together, finding a sport that your loved one enjoys and, and picking that up together, or maybe joining a class together or just simply going out for coffee. I'm not sure what it's like in Nova Scotia. I know that we can't do that here in Toronto, but once COVID lifts, but sometimes even not being able to go out for coffee, but just joining on a Zoom sort of coffee date. So just little things, practical things that loved ones can also do for those as we're journeying along with struggling. The second domain that I'd like to talk about in the area of recovery is what we refer to as the mental or the mental domain. Mental disorders are often a battle between reality and wrong or negative thoughts that overwhelm a person's mind. A structured approach to psychological needs is just as important to physical needs. And in, it can include some of the following suggestions. First, psychotherapy or counseling. Talk therapy, especially if it is in conjunction with sometimes people who need to take medication, but also in conjunction with being actively involved in a spiritual community has been shown to be most effective in treating mental illness. Important to find a trained counselor, but psychotherapy has been shown to be a very helpful um, sort of resource in working through some of these mental needs. Another important area is around healthy thinking. You know, often our emotions and behaviors are the result of what we think or believe about ourselves, people, and the world. And these thoughts can significantly shape how we interpret and evaluate what happens to us. It influences how we feel, and it actually can guide, how, you know, how we respond. And unfortunately, sometimes our interpretations, our evaluations, our underlying beliefs and thoughts contain a lot of distortion a lot of errors, a lot of biases. And the more a person's thinking is characterized by these distortions, the more likely they will experience negative emotions and maladaptive behaviors. And so there are some simple tools that we can utilize to help address some of these negative thinking that is important in this recovery process. Developing a process of being able to engage in more healthy thinking helps the individual identify what negative thoughts and stressors are related to my moods and behaviors. One practical way you can do this is even through journaling. This is actually a, a tool that is used in cognitive behavioral therapy. And in this journaling, it involves maybe identifying what your mood might be for today, or maybe a behavior that you engaged in that was a little bit dysfunctional. And then eventually, Evaluating, identifying what thoughts or beliefs are associated with that feeling or that behavior. And then taking time to evaluate, is this thought or belief accurate? Is it healthy? Is it even correct? And then when we recognize that maybe some of our beliefs or our thoughts are not accurate or are, are unhealthy, we then can begin to move towards challenging challenging to replace those with more healthier and more accurate thoughts. I know this sounds so much easier as I'm sharing this on a PowerPoint presentation, but I know that it can be so difficult to do it ourselves, but I also know that it is not impossible. And so once again, able to develop some sort of strategies to be able to catch some of our negative thoughts and to be able to replace them with some of our healthier thoughts. And then applying that even as Christians is, is that so often not only do we carry unhealthy thoughts, but many times we also carry unbiblical thoughts. I am unworthy. I am not loved. God does not love me. God does not know me. God has abandoned me. And yet not just about replacing those with more accurate thoughts, but actually truthful thoughts. And those truthful thoughts being rooted in the truth of scripture. Another very important sort of uh, process can be about help learning to cope better with problems. Right? Coping mechanisms, learned patterns of behaviors that we've developed to cope 
with life and stressors. And we've learned these either maybe from our own past experiences or maybe we've seen our parents or people around us cope in those ways. And negative coping choices often in the moment reduce those feelings of stress, but yet over time, they usually create problems of their own. For example, substance abuse, uh, being addicted to pornography, right? In the moment, it may be able to help us reduce that stress, but we know that it can create later problems down the road. And yet positive coping choices that when they're done in balanced ways, they can actually help diminish stress and actually enhance the quality of life. For example, just think like what we've been talking about, relaxation time, exercising, engaging in healthy connections with others, talking with a friend. And it's through there that, that when we're able to maybe identify any negative coping behaviors, maybe we can begin to make a choice to be able to engage in maybe even one healthier coping mechanism. Another important is about recognizing cycles and triggers. And we all have good days and bad days, and this is no different for individuals living with mental health difficulties or disorders. But a recovery-oriented lifestyle requires also gaining understanding and actually being educated about the predictable cycles and triggers of mental illness in order to better manage them. You know, oftentimes during times of stability, there are common signs that appear that often a more cycle coming, such as maybe losing sleep or oversleeping, maybe the sense of increased irritability or uh, not eating or overeating, or maybe now suddenly racing thoughts. And yet when we do not understand these cycles, what happens is, is we just start getting overwhelmed and controlled by these cycles. But when we're able to begin to identify some of these triggers that then start the cycle, this then can help us better manage them as well. And so what are some of the suggestions for family and friends who are journeying with a loved one who is struggling with mental illness, especially within the mental domain of recovery? Well, you know, I know it can oftentimes be difficult to, to bring up the topic of seeking professional help. And so I've just sort of included some very sort of practical ways that we can start the conversation about mental health. All right. So, you know, these may be some very benign kind of just gentle ways, such as, you know, I've been worried about you. Can we talk about what you're experiencing? If not, who are you comfortable talking to? Or I, I'm somebody who cares and wants to listen. And you want me to know. Or who or what has helped you deal with similar issues in the past? Maybe sometimes talking to someone who has dealt with a similar experience helps. Do you know of others who have experienced these types of problems who you could talk with? Seems like you're going through a difficult time. How can I help you find help? Or how can I help you find more information about mental health problems? Or I'm concerned about your safety. Have you thought about harming yourself or others? And if so, then we want to definitely move more into some proactive, um, maybe steps around you know, assessing harm or suicidality. For those with whom you may have a safer or closer relationship to, you know, we can even start to help them identify some of these maybe distorted or, or unhealthy thought patterns, negative coping behaviors, or even triggers and cycles. This can be done through safe, caring, open conversations where I really recommend you use more questions than giving of advice. And in asking these questions, sort of the, the really important purpose of these questions is to help explore the following. Number one, gaining a deeper understanding of what the person is actually going through. So asking our questions in ways that, you know, help us gain deeper understanding of what they're really going through. Secondly, asking the kinds of questions that can help the individual themselves see any kind of problem areas in their lives. Maybe some problems in substances, or maybe some of the problems in some of their, their behavioral or maybe coping mechanisms. And then third is to be able to help them asking questions to help them identify any kind of resources or strengths that they can draw upon. I know this is far easier for me to share than it is to do, 
and I know that there are many skills that we can learn and how to do this well. But, you know, again, many of us are far more equipped than we realize to know how to journey with others. It's just just being able to identify or maybe build some basic skills. And oftentimes I, I start by the skills of asking good questions. But I strongly recommend you not do two things. <laughs> Number one is give advice too early or give advice when unsolicited. Right? So oftentimes when we don't fully understand yet and we jump to advice, this can take away the safety and even the openness of that person communicating with us. Or if we you know, give advice that is unsolicited, you know, many times that can put the other person on the defensive. Right. Another thing I strongly recommend that we don't do is to push the individual beyond what they are ready to do. Right. And so, again, just a couple of really practical suggestions for family and friends who are journeying with loved ones, especially within the areas of mental health. The third area that I would like out is what we refer to as the relational needs. You know, we know that mental illness affects more than just the person with the disorder. It affects all of their relationships. And oftentimes the difficulty, stigma, and shame not only isolate the individual, but also families who are trying to care for mentally ill loved ones, even from the world around them. And so in addition, you know, the high levels of stress and difficult symptoms can also result in a lot of relational conflict that oftentimes requires forgiveness and reconciliation. And so therefore, a couple of relational needs that are important, not only for the individual struggling with mental illness, but also for family members and friends are first resolving conflict. You know, every relationship will have some conflict. Therefore, it's important for us to learn and from them. But resolving conflict is much more about compromising for a healthy conclusion than it is about proving ourselves right. It's more about trying to gain deeper understanding of someone else, especially somebody who is different, than about you know, digging my heels in the ground and saying that what my perspective is, is the only perspective. And so if you find yourself in a conflict with a loved one, especially one that may be struggling with a mental illness, we want to be able to ask ourselves whether this disorder may be clouding their judgment of the situation. And if so, allow ourselves to take a break and then maybe return later to follow up with more appropriate perspectives and emotions. Also, when we engage with them, using maximum to diffuse the tension than sort of confrontation. And also, many times, it's about making the choice not to take things too personally, especially if there's been some influence of the illness in their actions later. Another very important relational need um, that is an important part of the recovery process is also choosing to forgive. You know, sometimes that wrongful act or that hurt or offense, you know, will always remain a part of you know, the, your life, but forgiveness will definitely lessen its grip on us and also help us to focus on us, especially some of the positive parts. And we all know that forgiveness is a choice we make through a decision of our will. It's, it's motivated by our obedience to God and his, his command to forgive. And so just as we've been forgiven by God, we're called to forgive those who hurt us. Of course, this does not mean that we then you know, relieve of all sense of responsibility or accountability. But in many cases, especially when there is the realities of mental illness, that many times there is that kind of pain and hurt that happens in relationships and how forgiveness is also an important part of that recovery. And so for family and friends who are journeying with a loved one, it's imperative that you know we gain understanding about the disorder, because without this kind of deeper information and understanding, you know, many times we can lose hope and even withdraw or even misunderstand. And yet, supportive family and friends are one of the most important part of recovery for the one who is struggling. For people to be there to listen, to support, especially during the rough time. Even when your loved one is pushing you away. 
I want to really encourage you, please don't give up. Yes, of course, you know, we may need to take a break. There may need to be a bit of distance. There may need to be a little bit of a cooling off. But may you never give up, just as God never gives up. The final is what, what we'll refer to as the spiritual needs. And I just would love to close lecture two by touching upon the spiritual needs through a very real story of a client of mine, of how he was able to live out this spiritual layer in his process of recovery. I know that the church has a significant role to play in the lives of those struggling with mental illness, um, and we will be getting into that in lecture three, very specifics and tangibles about how the church can also play a vital role in this process and journey of recovery. But I'd like to just share a few things that can be implemented at the level of the individual who is struggling with the mental illness, as well as families and friends, especially Christian families and friends who are journeying with them. So this is a story of a client of mine about six years ago. And I had the privilege of walking with him through his journey of clinical depression. He was a young adult male who uh, struggled with some trauma-related depression and anxiety. You know, he went to counseling, he spent you know, time with his friends, but he chose to place his spiritual needs at the forefront of his journey because he knew that without God, he would, drop, he would be lost. And so in his quiet time with God, he continually sought to identify some of those unhealthy thoughts and beliefs about himself and the world. And he made the choice to replace them with the biblical truths, first and foremost, about his identity, that his identity is that as a beloved child of God. And in his quiet times, he focused on the ways that God was meeting him, walking with him, and even growing him through this valley of the shadow of death so that he could become the person who God created him to be, to live out the purpose that God had given for his life. And it was so difficult. And there were many times when he shared with me, you know, I don't feel like this is working. You know, I don't feel like I believe, even though I know. And yet he continued to choose to, to steep himself in the truth of God's word the truth of his identity, the truth of his purpose, not in his feelings, not in his distorted thoughts, not in his, his anxieties, but in the truth of who God is and who he is. As well, although it was so difficult at times, he continued to engage in spiritual disciplines that helped him grow spiritually. He would read so many books about God, about his faith, about the Bible, about his challenges in men and how God seek truth and stories of others who went through similar. And it was through these kinds of avenues and spiritual disciplines that I can remember him bringing some of the nuggets of truth that he, he gleaned from a book that he read. And we would just talk about that. And, and, and he would say again, you know, because that's what depression does. He'd be like, but I don't know if I truly feel it, but I'm going to choose to believe in the truth of who God is and that he is journeying with me. And so he engaged in these disciplines that would help him grow spiritually as well. He continued to reach out to his Christian brothers and sisters, especially when he felt he was going to fall into one of his depressive cycles. You know, even though he, even though he kept saying, like, I don't know if they're going to accept me. I don't know if they're going to, to, to love me. I don't know if they're going to, you know, understand me. He still chose to stay connected to his spiritual community. And it were so many times that he can remember that when he was just about to spiral, he would call and they would pray with him that they would encourage him, that they would just be present for him. And finally, you know, even through all of this, that he continued 
to choose to hold on to hope. I had the privilege of walking with him for about two years. He was a client of mine in California, and you know what? He was never fully cured of his depression and his anxiety. He still continued to, to wrestle through with those feelings of, of, of guilt and worthlessness, of sometimes that crippling fear and anxiety. But he was able to move toward recovery in every domain as he continued to hold on to the hope and the promises of God. This is an encouragement and an invitation to maybe for some of you who may be struggling with mental illness, that I know that the spiritual needs, sometimes it can be so difficult, so difficult to remain faithful in your time with the Lord, to stay faithful in your connections with your community. But just like my client said, without God, he doesn't know where he'd be. And so I hope and pray that this will be a gentle invitation, even though you may not feel like it or always believe it, that you will hold on to the truth of who God is and his hope and his promises. And so then in closing, what then can we as loved ones, family and friends who are journeying with those who are struggling with mental illness kind of do in response to this? Well, I'd love to end with some closing thoughts, especially for those who are journeying together with a loved one struggling with mental illness. So one, please be reminded because we're living in that messy middle, recovery too. Can be messy. You know, people living with mental illness can oftentimes behave in strange and bizarre ways. You know, their perception of the world and those around them can be very different. They may even perceive your attempts to help them as being a threat. They may deny having a problem. They may refuse to be involved in treatment. You know, and these are difficult issues, you know, long-term and messy, sometimes requiring steadfast commitment on your part, because that is the truth of it all. Recovery can be messy. Second, try not to hold this expectation that you'll be appreciated. Actually, in fact, you might even receive the opposite. I've known of many, many friends and family members who have had a lot of wrath, a lot of misunderstanding, a lot of their, their loved one's anger, the, the rejection, actually, in the midst of that recovery process. And so don't expect to be appreciated. Sometimes you might receive the opposite. Another important closing thought is hold realistic expectations of your loved one and yourself. You know, we want to be able to identify maybe just one or two areas of the domains that we've discussed, maybe even one practical thing that we can try. And remember that this is a process. And just like I said, sometimes it can feel like one step forward, two steps back. Another very important, take time. To care for yourself. You know, I heard today uh, in one of the, the breakout or the, the work I've given by April, I heard that her theme was about taking care of ourselves while taking care of our loved ones. And I think that is so spot on. Right? We need to spend time taking care of ourselves while we are taking care. So spending time with God, spending time with family and friends, really, you know, making sure that we commit to those in our lives, recognizing our limits and extending grace to ourselves, remembering that you are not alone. God is present with you in the midst of the storm, and he will provide sustaining grace as you walk and journey together towards hope, recovering, and healing, whatever that might look like, and choosing to trust and surrender the loved one and the process of recovery back into God's hands. Because in the midst of that, we want to always be anchored in the hope that is found in God's promises and presence. And so in closing, I leave you with this passage from 2 Corinthians chapter 1 through to 4. Praise be to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, 
so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. Blessings upon you as you journey with your loved one through the messy middle of mental illness and suffering. Let's pray together and I'll close our time up for today. Lord, we come before you this evening. And Father, we surrender. We surrender ourselves. We surrender our loved ones. We surrender our family and our friends who are struggling with mental illness or are journeying with those who are. Lord, will you minister in a way that only you can minister your comfort, your peace, your strength, and your hope. So Lord, we thank you for being a God who not only journeys with us, but provides us all that we need to journey with those in our lives. So we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Dr. No, thank you very much for taking us tonight on a journey. There's a, a few phrases in there that I, I think I'm carrying away. The phrase living in the messy middle, I think many people found very helpful. Uh, recovery rather than cure and, and what it means to walk with people in recovery and that, that long, that which can be a long journey. These are two phrases that Keeping loving, even if a loved one is pushing you away. Yes, maybe standing back, but never giving up. And the exploration, very helpful exploration of different areas in which we can address issues, physical issues, uh, whatever we mean by mental issues or spiritual issues. I think there's so much in there that people will be able to pick up on and, and remember, reflect upon, and hopefully be able to to apply in practice. So thank you very, very much for that. We appreciate it very much. I do have, and we do have time for some questions. I should say, I know that some people have been having, or we've been having a little bit of a jittery internet at times, but I am glad to say, despite that, we were able all the time to follow. So that was good. And uh, I, think, I think folk were quite able to follow along with it, even though there were a couple of moments of pauses so I, I have some questions. I'll, I'll pick one from here and then that will give some other people some other time. Some, someone asked this, are there certain, in your experience, are there certain socio-cultural environments that seem to be more prone to mental health challenges than others? That's a really wonderful question. And... Um... Yeah, you know, I think definitely at the most fundamental level, we are all vulnerable to any kind of the mental disorders that we've been talking about. And yes, absolutely. You know, I think that there are some definitely sociocultural factors that can make, uh, you know, I don't want to generalize and say that the whole group to be more vulnerable, but there are definitely some factors, for example, um, certain cultures that may hold a greater stigma, right? A stigma again definitely prevent or hinder uh, an individual from seeking the help that they may need. All right. So, if, especially if a culture, and it can also be a Christian culture, where there is a very strong stigma around mental illness. Um, other kind of factors can be even around sort of, you know, I know in the Asian culture, there's a very strong shame-based mentality where we don't share our struggles outside of the family. We don't share what we're going through because that brings shame and dishonor to the family. And we can see how that could absolutely sort of increase one's vulnerability who may be in some of those cultures from actually seeking the help and maybe, and it can be all sorts of sort of disorders that they may be facing, but it can increase the vulnerability just because these steps necessary. You know, there are also other kinds, you know, there are gender biases or there may be just even sort of um, views around medication. You know, these could also be some of the, the factors that, you know, we, we pick up in our different cultures and in our different sort of teachings that may, you know, either um, 
increase one's sort of um, resistance to getting help. But in terms of actual specific disorders themselves, I mean, again, I would hate to generalize some of these cultures to actual specific disorders. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's very helpful. Thank you. Someone has asked this. They said, as we journey with others, would you suggest that this is the optimum path to promote healing? Is it physical, mental, relational, then spiritual, or is it messier? Is it in the messy middle? I don't know. Oh, it's definitely in the messy. It's much messier. You know, again, I wanted to sort of give you the holistic overview. You know, this again was. Uh, adapted by uh, Dr. Stanford's book, but yet, you know, putting in a lot of, of sort of my own sort of thoughts into it. And so, you know, it, it was meant to give you this holistic sort of paradigm. And maybe for uh, some of you, it will just be one area that you may be able to, to journey with others, right? Maybe it, it will be in the physical. It will be just simply being able to, to, to provide with them for some of them, maybe helping them out with some, you know, healthy meals, maybe engaging with them and something at the for to, to go a little bit deeper and to be able to because we have a safer relationship with them that we may be able to sort of journey with them at the mental level and we're able to you know challenge them in some of their distorted thoughts so we're able to sort of uh, work with them in in some of their um, unhealthy coping patterns or, or behaviors and then you know for all of us, absolutely, especially within the church, we can definitely, and this is the most vital part, is the spiritual needs. And I think that all of us are called to be able to walk with others, if anything, at the spiritual level, for sure. But again, it, it doesn't mean that it, it's not in some sort of, you know, order or progression or, or in any kind of a formula in that way. It's, it's far messier. And again, it's not meant for one person to be able to do all of this, but it's more like, how do I understand the holistic picture of recovery and where might my part be in walking with this particular individual based on you know, my availability, my strengths, my giftings, you know, all of those things put together. Yeah, and, and, and to follow up from that then, so it's a two-part question. The first part is, should Christian people only go to Christian, if they're seeking professional help, Christian counsellors? And whether they should or not, so I'm leaving that as an open question. Uh, whether they should or not, is, is, do you know, is there a list of Christian counsellors? Is there a specific way of doing that? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. On where you live and sort of the resources that you have. I know here in Toronto, we have a rich resource of, of Christian counsellors, um, mainly because we are teaching and training the bulk of them here in Toronto at Tyndale in the counseling program. And so, yes, so we have a great sort of uh, list of resources and references. We also at Tyndale have a family life center, which we provide counseling to those in our community. And every therapist there is a Christian who has then been trained professionally. And so, you know, it will really depend on where you reside and the resources that you have. And so with that being said, I know of many non-Christian therapists who are wonderful people and extremely competent in what they do. And so if you cannot, because of where you live, find a Christian psychotherapist, absolutely, you know, going to a very well-trained psychotherapist is probably better than not at all. But you do have, you know, the, the options available to be able to go to somebody that does come from a similar framework of understanding, you know, brokenness and, and healing and, and, and the role of God and, and church and whatnot. It can just help to sort of uh, put you on the same sort of starting point. And then from there, of course, it will depend on how that Christian therapist will then um, work. But yes, just to be able to have that same sort of framework around, uh, you know, what we understand of mental illness and also the process of healing can be a little bit helpful in, in that way. So, mm -hmm. yeah, no, thank you again. And I was going to ask this, you, you mentioned, not in passing, but when you were talking about ways that could help, have you, again, in your experience, noticed that there is either an increase or an intensity around 
uh, the demands of the digital, the, the presence of social media, the, the fact that we might work at home, but actually what that means is we don't have home anymore because we've just got work. Have, have you noticed anything around that? In terms of its impact on mental health? Oh, absolutely. I'm going to be um, sharing some statistics tomorrow based on the most recent um, sort of search in October 2020, looking at the impact of COVID on mental health. And absolutely, I mean, we are seeing, um, you know, we do see different age groups being affected a little bit differently. And so finding that definitely those who are more in the single life stage, so in the young adult stage, you know, they, they have not yet, you know, married and, and sort of found their own sort of uh, um, spouse, that they are struggling with significantly more levels of things like loneliness, isolation, you know, this, this whole kind of quarantine and, sh and, and, and shutdown have really taken a toll on them internally, in terms of the levels of of depression, isolation, levels of feelings of loneliness. We're finding that sort of in the middle, it's like, you know, the, the families with young children, um, with middle, they're just feeling overwhelmed, right? I don't know what it, Nova Scotia, but here when, you know, the children are all uh, staying home from school. And, and, you know, I can even speak from some of my students that, uh, that I'm teaching right now, right? They have four young children at home and they're, and they're, you know, trying to do their studies or they're trying to work and they're trying to make me ends meet. I mean, they're just being so overwhelmed with anxiety is what we're finding a lot more in this middle sort of age group. It's just this kind of anxiety anxiety, but certainty, the financial struggles, how do I balance all of this? How do I manage all this? What's going to happen to my children? All of these kind of factors. And then uh, we find that, you know, they, they found that sort of those more in the senior range, of course, maybe those who are living by themselves are also feeling the brunt of the isolation, but they're finding that those seniors who are now in retirement age, still living with their, their spouse are actually uh, the least affected in terms of the impact on their mental health. That's sort of just the general findings that we've been we've been noting. Of course, this is not saying everybody fits in this category. Um, but yeah, absolutely, you know, the whole um, magnification of some of these issues, you know, no work home balance at all. We're all just bringing our work at home. We're just, you know, there's no line anymore. Absolutely, it's taking a big toll. Yeah. And um, on people's mental health have said that their mental health has, we're not saying that they developed a mental disorder, but their mental health has decreased significantly, yes. Yeah. And someone has asked, how, how do we know when, when, when is it time for a loved one really to seek professional help? Yeah. I, I, know, I know that has to be context specific, I, I understand, but can you just give us a few, a few yeah. pointers when we would need to think, yeah, this, this is yeah. serious. At the very extreme is if they are talking about hurting themselves or hurting others, that is cause for very kind of immediate and, and, and you know, you don't have to necessarily call 911 or, you know, put them into a hospital, but, you know, we don't want to be just, um, you know, hearing that and letting it go. So. Absolutely, if they have expressed sort of the intent to hurt themselves or hurt others, uh, that's when we want at the most extreme. And then anywhere in between is when we're noting, just as I, I mentioned that these symptoms or behaviors are creating and causing enough impairment, right? So something for like depression that they can't get out of bed all day, that they can't take care of their children, um, they can't seem to go to work. Uh, they can't seem to follow through on just the, the, the minor, minor tasks of the day. When their anxiety is keeping them homebound, when, when they're so steeped with that anxiety or fear or worry that, you know, they can't even, you know, it's turned to paranoia or it's turned to, you know, something where it's actually, you know, hindering them from being able to function. That's probably, those are probably the two really clear legs as to when you might want to be a little bit more proactive about maybe gently suggesting that your loved one might you know just be open to the idea 
of seeking sort of professional or help outside of themselves or this family. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for that. And a, a question here, I, which I think is an interesting one, if, if I'm reading it correctly, and I, I hope the person who's asked the question my, my, agrees with my paraphrase, I think it relates to having a little knowledge that's not helpful. And, and what, the, what they've asked is, are there tools that the average Christian might have at their disposal, but in fact we are likely to misuse. So the example they gave was someone with a has been in a suicide prevention course and, and they see someone who's got need, but the person with need doesn't meet the criteria that they were taught in the course, for example. How, how, do, we, how do we avoid not misusing our little knowledge in a harmful way? Yeah. Well, that's why I always you know, and sense of building a relationship with that person, right? I mean, you know, very few of us are going to just hear some random person, you know, meet the criteria for the suicide, you know, list and we go, you know, and we jump in, right? It's usually somebody within, you know, our sphere and somebody we have a relationship with. And so, you know, I would always, always balance knowledge and education with actually the relationship and getting to know the person, right? I mean, even today, as I was sharing about this, why am I gave that caution, please do not utilize this to start diagnosing. <laughs> That's a big thing that we see all the time. And, you know, to be, to, to remember that it's about first and foremost, building a relationship with that person, getting to understand what it is truly that they're struggling with and not just supplanting our, our, our little knowledge or our education and assuming that because they you know, are struggling this way, they must meet all the criteria of depression or all the criteria of suicide you know, ideation or, or you know, of anxiety because as much as the DSM-5, which is the diagnostics you know, manual that we use to make these diagnoses, each individual is so unique. Each struggle is so unique and what they need is going to be so unique. And so I would say, choose relationship first. And then as we get to know them and get to know the uniqueness of what they're going through, then when we have some helpful information and knowledge, we can then utilize it to enhance it rather than limit it because we then put them in that. Yeah, no, thank you. I think that, that's very helpful guidance for us all the relationship and building that relationship. I have a couple of questions, but I, I think there's one here, or I, I saw it in the chat. You, you spoke about uh, sleep, you know, lack of sleep. What about a person that is recurring nightmares? Is that a, a warning sign? I, I mean, I'm, I'm not asking you to diagnose anyone. So in, in very general terms, I, I found a, an interesting question that was asked. Yeah, no. There are many different reasons for recurring kind of nightmares, and I would hate to give some sort of answer, and then it's 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 not based on full knowledge. And so, you know, oftentimes, you know, when we um, do get jolted uh, in our sleep because of recurring nightmares, sometimes it can be trauma related. I mean, there's oftentimes that's one of the the indicators of you know these trauma related is these recurrent nightmares of the actual trauma feeling of it and we are sort of reliving it in our dreams and in the nightmares sometimes again it just it may be just even um, being overwhelmed with stress or anxiety can also cause us to engage in these kinds of disrupted sleeps that may manifest as recurring kind of nightmares around the fears or the anxieties and whatnot. And so, you know, it can, it can range the spectrum. Um, and, and so again, I just want to be very careful so that we don't miss and uh, as to why we may be going through that. And so, yeah, it, it could be as simple as just very, very, you know, an indicator that you're, you're, holding a lot of stress or anxiety or it could be at the other end of the spectrum just maybe trauma related but I, I maybe missed so oh no no just one more that I, i've maybe missed someone has has asked uh, what about programs or processes like processes like celebrate recovery i'm, I'm not i'm not familiar with it myself 
it, are, are these helpful or? Absolutely. <laughs> these kinds of programs, you know, in terms of, you know, what do we mean by helpful? I mean, does it, you know, full healing and restoration at the deepest levels? Maybe not always. I mean, but again, you know, going back to our layered paradigm of personhood is, is that, you know, when, when, when there is that layer of behavioral dysfunctions like addictions, right, that these kinds of programs that really target addiction at a very behavioral level, then of course, as we talked about yesterday, that of course the layers are all kind of connected to each other. But if we can learn some of the tools of, of, of you know, the addiction and what are some of the triggers and, and, and how can we be able to, some of the steps we can go through or, you know, other kinds of recovery sorts of, of, of programs that absolutely it can give really help knowledge in terms of understanding our wounds, uh, what are some practical steps, and then oftentimes the greatest things of these kinds of, uh, you know, groups is the group accountability. And so you have people who have gone through similar uh, experiences and you just sort of partner up and there's these like accountabilities there's like you know being able to meet with somebody who maybe is a few years ahead of you and so you, you gain that kind of mentoring so absolutely you know when we look at the other layers of so the behavioral and relational and emotional these can be very helpful in that way mm -hmm. thank you for that well one other question come in but i'm going to save it for tomorrow but i'll, I'll give you the heads up it's a question, and maybe this one would have come up tomorrow anyway. It's, it's, it's a question about mental illness and spiritual warfare. And I'm sure you've been asked this before. But we'll tuck that one in for tomorrow. Uh, and, and, and we can come back to it because we've, we've had you speaking to us. We've had you answering our questions. And we appreciate the time that you've taken to do that. We thank you very much for doing that tonight. Again, with your your own passion and compassion is evident, and and that that itself is, I think, very helpful to people as you discuss these issues uh, with us. So we appreciate that very much indeed. Thank you for that and for your lecture tonight. We look forward to the red sofa conversation tomorrow and also to your lecture tomorrow night and I'd, I'd remind people again also there is a chapel service tomorrow and we thank you for joining with us tonight if you want to check the details of the times tomorrow please just go on to the the website and have a look at them so we thank Dr Noah again for being with us this evening for speaking to us my thanks again to John in the room who's been managing many things for helping this to happen and we thank you for joining with us. I, I, I would like to complete tonight with a prayer. Uh, the prayer I used at the beginning came from my little Celtic prayer book and the prayer with which I finish comes from the same source. Let's pray together. O oh Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and compassion towards us and we trust ourselves into your loving care. For we are weak, give us strength, where we lack faith, fill us with confidence. Where we are cold, open our hearts to your dear Son, that he may enter to heal our wounds and to be our sweet companion all the days of our life, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining with us. <laughs>